Well, hi guys. Uh, welcome to the second webinar in our summer series. Uh, if you tuned in last week to watch James talking about glass and the transparency challenge, uh, you were in good company. We had about 450 people watching and tuning in for that. So that was a really good event. Um, if this is your first event, then uh, welcome. And we're really glad to have you on board. Um, if you missed or you want to see James's presentation again, then you can head over to the news section on our website. And that is uh, where all of our webinars will be, um, will be put up for the future things, if you want to see any of those again. Um, if um, it's also on the news section, that's also incidentally where, um, uh, where you can see the list of webinars, the future webinars that we've got in our series. We've got another, I think, seven, I think, to go after this, which is good. Um, and you can sign up to them there. Uh, just a little bit of housekeeping. Hugh is going to do questions at the end of the webinar. Um, and so if you've got any questions, I think there should be a chat box on the right hand side of your screen. Oh, it's reversing everything. So that side of your screen. Um, so pop in your questions over there um, and we'll sort those out at the end. Uh, I am Catherine Smale. I'm Ekazia Callahan's marketing manager. So if you've got any questions, you want to get in touch, then feel free. I can see that um, people are already getting involved on the uh, on the chat box. So, um, you know, it's lovely to hear from you. So if you want to be interactive, then we're more than welcome of that. Um, so there are 263 of you joining us today. So uh, it should be a really good event. And what's left to do now is to hand you over to Hugh. He's going to introduce himself and talk about the specialist generalist. Over to you, Hugh. Perfect. Thank you, Kat. Um, yeah. Hi all. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Hugh. I've, I joined EOC in 2012 as a structural engineer, uh, but moved swiftly into our facade department when we created it in 2012. Um, uh, I'm an associate director there, so part of the leadership team. Um, I should mention that this webinar draws on an article that my colleague Sun Pierce and I wrote not long ago for the Structural Engineering Journal, um, which called for thought pieces on uh, future trends in the industry. So please bear my allegiances in mind for what's to come as it's, I'll try not to be biased, but there may be some bias in what I say. Um, so for those who haven't read the blurb, I wanted to talk today about a growing concern I have over the state of our industry. Um, as a designer, I look around and see a myriad of clients, architects, surveyors, engineers, consultants, subconsultants, 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 main contractors, pre-contract services, trade contractors, and, and so the list goes on. Um, these are all all these parties are, are lumped together in various ways depending on how a project is procured and it's it's often not impossible to establish who should be involved how they should work together when they should get involved um, and each project reliably combines all these parties together often for the first time and sometimes for the last time and each party usually has a different interpretation of the system um, usually influenced by what we've done before and what their educational background was so I believe it's a, a system that has grown reactively over the years and it's, it's arguably broken um, and it's caused and continues to cause large inefficiencies, risks and unfortunately disasters to manifest themselves. Um, so uh, moving on, I thought I'd also touch on um, the context of the, you know, the more the recent climate and biodiversity crisis. Um, it shows that sustainability is rapidly becoming the most important influence on, on our developments. Um, at EOC, we were the first day signatories um, of Engineers Declare, um, and we're focusing hard, hard on how to change things. But we're finding that sustainability is such a holistic concept, um, and that the status quo of our disparate and siloed design teams are, are making making progress difficult. Um, so, um, to attempt to address this problem, I thought I'd look firstly at the roots and the foundations of our construction teams, and to understand why our design teams and procurement routes became so complicated and why, you know, to contextualize what I think the problem is. After that quick history, I'll attempt to define the problem a little better and then I'll hypothesize on a little poten you know, a potential solution, um, by no means fleshed out, but a potential solution in the form of a specialist generalist engineer. So uh, jumping into history, um, way back when, buildings were designed and constructed by this, the same person who acted as architect, builder, craftsman, designer, and engineer. And we romantically refer to this guy as a uh, master builder. Um, um, and essentially what I want to try and track is how we ended up getting from the top of this page as a, a single entity to the, the, frankly, the mess at the bottom of this page and the, and the, and the sort of contemporary design team. And I'll do this by um, quick, 
by summarizing the various stages of construction into a summary matrix um, and look at performance materials and systems, which is how I rationalize these things, um, and try and demonstrate the complexities that have arisen over the centuries. Um, and I'll also use this diagram that I put together to try and track the division and broadening of the design team over time um, and demonstrate that it's a reactive um, uh, organic growth um, in the modern industry. Um, so it's quite a complicated diagram, especially on a little screen at home, I'm sure. But um, down the left, it kind of roughly tracks time um, and it shows some key policy milestones and some formation uh, of various institutions. Um, and so apologies if it's, if it's not exhaustive. Um, through the middle there, I've sort of I've broadly and probably totally inaccurately lumped different parties into different schools of thought and different educational backgrounds, um, which roughly align with our UK system. And on the right, uh, it's just a, a tally of how many people are involved and the number of potential communication lines there. So starting with a master builder at the top. Um, um, to get some insight into to the master builder, we could go back to the writings of Vitruvius in ancient Rome. Um, and he wrote um, uh, uh, he wrote some quite inspiring things on building design practices back in ancient Rome. Um, he talked about practice and about theory, and he drew some interesting conclusions on the need for an architect to both be able to design um, and also to be able to build. Um, he described a good building as satisfying three principles of fermitatis, ulitatis, and venustatis, which means stability, utility, and beauty. And I guess these kind of define some of the you know classical orders and, and so on, and, and um, are, are overarching and, and, and still apply today, although it's been somewhat um, complicated. Then unfortunately we dropped into the dark ages in Western Europe and we forgot a lot of that interesting stuff. But our focus on war and religion in this time meant we did gradually begin to produce some very fantastic buildings and castles and cathedrals, which are a credit to the skills of the medieval master builders who were still relatively single, singular entities in design. Um, so populating the matrix I discussed, um, looking down the left, you can see that in performance terms, um, we had the three Vitruvian performance requirements of stability, utility and beauty. Um, and they also were concerned about security and about daylight. Um, in terms of materials, the, uh, the materials used were typically vernacular and raw and had minimal pre-processing and you know, building systems. So there were traditional buildings that demanded the skill of a craftsman, such as timber and stone and brick and lead and so on. Um, the most advanced is probably Roman concrete, but unfortunately that got lost in, in forgotten in the Dark Ages. Um, and simple building systems are employed. Um, these, there were empirical advancements in structures, such as domes and arches, um, and advances were made on rudimentary building services, but these were lost in time, and predominantly buildings adopted um, passive systems, such as natural ventilation. Um, but the broader picture is that this was still an, a manageable number of parameters and, and things for, for one person to be thinking about, with the, with the assistance, of course, of skilled craftsmen behind it. Um, but that, that changed when we got to the Renaissance, um, and the Renaissance was a rekindling of the interest in the science and the progress of the ancient civilizations. And this led to a split um, between the process of design and construction at that stage, um, and led to the, the appearance of the first humanist architects um, and the guilds and masons who would actually execute and build design. Um, and the, the bell tower at Florence as well was the first example of this. Um, but the architect at this time was still a very much a polymath figure, trained through apprenticeship, who covered all bases of the building design. Um, and guilds were collections of craftsmen who worked still with raw building materials with pooled but protected knowledge um, but, and with no codes and standards to work from. And this lack of codes and standards extended to a lack of central design or planning regulations. Um, and that became clear after the Great Fire of London, which caused widespread damage. Um, it gave birth to the London Building Act, which put safety and damage limitation on the agenda. Um, and it also um, inspired the first insurance policies, which were, interest, which were very interesting and, and um, spawned the sort of privatised fire, first fire brigades in London. Um, then the Industrial Revolution came along and, and, and literally changed everything for us. Um, and off the back of the scientific um, revolution um, and advancements of the Enlightenment, um, machines and industrial processes, they began to bring efficiencies in tr to, tr to the trades. and. And, and the things that were previous to the remit of the craftsman. Um, uh, and, it, and it affected various things. Um, in terms of building requirements and performance requirements, um, urban densification and widespread pandemics of things like cholera made it clear that health and hygiene needed focus. And people like Pet and Coffer and Florence Nightingale contributed to a, a focus on you know, simple human requirements such as air quality, water, um, daylight, drainage. 
um, in materials. Um, you mentioned at Portland Cement popularized popularized the use of modern cement and the Bessemer process for steel um, made uh, made steel commercially efficient for use in primary structure for the first time. And the body of science accumulating from the Enlightenment led to a more calculated approach to design. Um, and this was coupled with an increased need for infrastructure uh, to support the growing towns and industry and trade. And this saw the birth of the civil and municipal engineers um, to develop modern roads, railways, canals, sewers, flood defences and so on. Um, and capitalism and Adam Smith's principle of the division of labour also established itself. More and, and more professional institutions were founded to help formalise their roles and services in a reaction to uh, the new competitive free markets. So we began to see that after the split of design and construction, um, further splits on the design side were happening. Um, and the birth of the engineer um, happened as things, the materials and systems became more technical and scientific in nature. Um, so looking back at this summary table, um, we begin to see that the, the picture was becoming more complicated and now at this stage beyond the capability of one individual to manage alone. Um, and this was reflected in educational practices as well, um, in the UK at least, um, with separate architecture and engineering schools being established. And, and this meant that at the time, architects often started receiving a more classical theoretical training in fine art and architectural theory rather than the old hands-on apprenticeship approach um, of previous generations. Um, just buzzing through the rest of this um, table, um, you can pick up on the fact there was key building regulation policy in the 19th century. Um, which sort of spurred um, mechanical, electrical, public health engineers to, to, to set up institutions and start providing their services. And RICS was also founded at this time, which saw an additional split into a sort of commercial arm of the design team um, due to a step change in the fact that we started at that point costing buildings before we bought, built them rather than just valuing them afterwards, which just seems bizarre nowadays. But. Um, and um, the turn of the century, uh, saw the first plastics introduced, it saw the publication of the first standard uh, construction contracts, and it saw the foundation of the ice truck tea. Um, and following the world First World War and reaction to this and the tragic fire at the um, Albert Embankment in 1918, the Institute of Fire Engineers was, was formalised um, to advise on fire safety. Um, and in following the Second World War, um, we saw a shift in client demographic with more large corporations demanding better quality after a slump in, in post-war quality. Um, and so a, a host of other um, disciplines arose, including environmental engineers, architects, technologists, the project managers, acousticians, and so on. Um, and SIPSI was, was formed at this point as a, as a consolidation of the number of building um, services professionals into one under one umbrella, which is what we like. Um, so, just buzzing to the bottom of this. Um, more significant pol policy followed in the 80s um, and sustainability was put on the agenda as well as CDM. Um, and the last um, uh, professional institution there is the Society of Facade Engineers, which represents, it's another very valuable, but again, a reactive contri contributor to, to the modern industry. So um, having got to the end of that, apologies if it's um, a lot of time drilling on the same diagram. Um, you'll notice that I have sort of neglected the right-hand side of this equation, which is the construction arm um, uh, and it's that's got an equally complex in his you know history of procurement and specialisms but I have I'm not going to touch on that because I haven't got time and to be honest I probably don't have the knowledge um, so um, now we've looked briefly at the history um, I thought I'd try and frame the problem um, a little better and to help do this I thought I'd borrow from the zero carbon hubs research into why we have consistent performance gaps in our buildings um, and they they boiled it down to three people problems, which are sort of uh, knowledge and skills, responsibility, and communication. So touching on these individually, um, the problem of knowledge and skills is is wide ranging, but I wanted to focus on education and experience. Um, there there are very various ways to start out your career in the construction industry, but on the design side, it is predominantly through formal education in in a subject, and you graduate and you get thrust into some responsibility. Um, the diagram I've drawn is. Is of course a generalization but for simplicity you can quickly identify that a lot of individuals um, come out of university with a blinkered outlook um, at least in the uk an engineering degree will often leave one without a holistic understanding of how a building is conceived how we pay for it how it's built um, and similarly young professionals on the construction side might lack insight on in, into why a design is the way it is and, and why, a, why a client brief is the way it is um, so when you compare this to the master builder 
um, who was the product of a lifelong apprentice, you know, lifelong hands-on apprenticeship um, with previous masters and, and empirical knowledge and of form being handed down from master to apprentice and, and learning through trial and error. Um, you, you can see that it, it's, it's a very different model. And of course, nowadays we can't expect one person to cover all the bases because um, there's just too much to know. Um, yet it still falls to the single architect to try and lead a whole host of specialists towards a common goal. Um, this model used to work, but with the modern complexity of design instruction, it's ugly infeasible, essentially, to expect one pers person to, to do this. Um, and in terms of responsibility, um, I think this is largely born out of confusion, um, the problem of responsibility. Um, you know, a trend towards performance-based design has, has made lines of responsibility much harder to define and difficult to manage, and often ends up in the notorious scope gap. Um, and for example, the, the lack of clarity in roles and responsibilities was identified in the Hackett review as a, as a key cont contributor to the Grenfell tra tragedy. Um, and an outcome of that review is to suggest that a golden thread of responsibility at the heart of the building um, regulations is required, which is the, the key topic of the, the very recent promise of reform. And the communication problem, um, and this is largely a numbers and a language problem. Um, by looking back um, at the history we just, we just did, um, you can see in the Victorian era, we had maybe six parties with a total of maybe 15 conversations happening. Um, now we've got over 30 or so people just on the design side with over 400, 500 different potential conversations to have. And, and these conversations are all happening on, you know, on people on their own agenda and talking subtly different languages because of their architect, um, sort of educational background. Um, so in summary, you know, so I'm sort of saying we're a siloed industry. We off, you know, we often graduate with our blinkers on, essentially, um, and, and it's hard for us to achieve holistic designs with, with some of our knowledge and skills. And we really do need to, to work together. Um, and we're rarely clear on responsibilities. Uh, and we have a communication problem due to the number of parties and the languages we're talking. And I've also added another problem in here, which is that specialisms, specialisms are being viewed more and more as commodities. Um, they're often engaged at the wrong time in the building design, which is ironic given that the technical performance is an increasingly um, important design driver. So, so rolling on to uh, some food for thought, essentially. Um, it's a concept we've been toying with at EOC for a while now, and it, it frames a lot around the work we do in facades in particular. Um, and this is the idea of a sector-specific specialist generalist lead, um, particularly yeah, a technical specialist generalist lead. Um, so taking the current team sheet that we, we spoke about earlier, um, we're thinking a model might look something like this. Um, so whilst we still see the architect continue to operate the, the lead designer role, um, we believe that there should be a generalist engineering presence um, at, at the, the top table, essentially, which would serve to complement their work, um, the, the work of the architect, by bringing together the technical aspects of the design, which should you know, become a much more, you know, much greater driver in modern times. So this two-headed design leadership collaboration would be supplemented then by commercial and um, construction lead to create a, a, a very small core team of four, um, four pillars, if you like, within a, within a project. Um, and clearly the minutiae of the arrangements needs to be um, developed, but for the sake of this diagram, I've just grouped the people, um, the, you know, the, the consultants, according to how they're educated um, from my diagram earlier. Um, so picking up on this, um, making a small high performing team of empowered decision makers essentially um, will, will allow them to take responsibility to collectively realizing the best outcome for a project. So the high level conversations they could have and the decision making would become more informed, it would become holistic, it would become streamlined. Um, and they do that through the distillation of specialist advice by, by these trained leaders. Um, and they would solve the knowledge problem. This would solve the knowledge problem. Um, because it allows us to better leverage the, the untapped human wealth we have on the uh, human capital, sorry, we have on the team. Um, and direct reporting, if we, we, did, we adopted this model in a more, much more hierarchical manner, would also clean up the lines of responsibility and solve that problem. It would allow accountability for more informed scoping and appointments. Um, and it would also turn, it would also potentially allow turnkey services um, to be offered, which you know, fundamentally going to be attractive to clients. So this could happen through multi-dis organizations or it could happen through collaboration of um, high performing teams who, who have good working relationships. Um, and it would also reduce the number of interconnections between people by um, um, by by removing lots of those connections. Um, so each lead figure would become responsible for curating the input from their relevant specialists and, and that would solve the communication problem. Um, 
and it would also facilitate much richer conversations about sustainability and inject insights engineering insights at least much earlier into the design problem which would also help solve the trend of commoditization and sort of bolt on the services that we're seeing so clearly all, all four leaders would need to be empathetic to one another they they would need to talk a common language um and they'd need to be able to challenge one another um and so to achieve this clearly we're not in a position to do that yet but um we, we could be with with the help of institutions and, and the educational system um, and and picking specifically on the technical generalist um specialist generalist engineer um i've put together a brief job spec um and to say that you know they'd have to be certainly a curious and questioning mindset they they need to ability they need ability to coherently challenge concepts and, and use rigor they'd need to um, make educate, educated deductions and and make choices based on first principles um they need the ability to dive into enough detail on, on a topic to weigh up the technical variables and they need you to influence the other specialist um, designers in in order to reach um, the optimum solution so what I'm aware what I'm wary of is we don't necessarily want to introduce a new person to what is already a, a very crowded um, team chief so it could potentially be the evolution of the currently established role um, which is where my potential bias comes in um, um, the decision over who that might be um, is is clearly a function of the development brief. But from from the position I have and from what I've exposed to of the industry, um, I I would with bias say that a structural engineer or a facade engineer might be a well placed person to 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 take on some training and to upskill and venture into that role in the future. Um, and I can say that from the safety of my own house. I don't think anybody can heckle on this program. Um, and the reason I'm saying that is because of some of the work we're doing at EOC facades. Um, First of all, the leadership team, the four of us um, in, in facades, uh, are, all, are all from a structural engineering background, which has meant that moving into facades, we've had to significantly diversify our knowledge and, and our sphere of influence on building projects. Um, and we found that we really need to understand the technical workings of the specialists um, in order to distill these and you know, be successful in our building envelope designs, because the building envelope does interact with, with pretty much every other discipline. So we kind of see ourselves already as a variety of a specialist generalist, although you know um, reserved just for the, the sort of facade portion. Um, and the diagram above, you know, here just um, gives an inkling into the sort of coordination we need to do on that front, and the sort of um, understanding we need to have of all these different parameters. Um, and we found within this work that uh, the Pareto principle, which which says that eighty percent of effects come from twenty percent of causes, we, we kind of found that, that can also be always be mapped onto knowledge and, and language if you like um in that 80 percent of the capability of something um can probably be gleaned from roughly 20 percent of the time it would take somebody to really really master it um and we don't need to really really master it we just need to be able to understand the the, the, the basic principles and and challenge people um so for example you know in facades in particular it's affected by the the movements and tolerances of the primary structures affected by the behavior of the mq provision it's affected by the fire strategies and, and it's affected by you know the requ required acoustic performance um so we found that we, we need to be able to talk in kilowatts kilonewtons kilojoules and kilohertz all with equal dexterity and, and only through learning other trades are we able to do that effectively um so uh, to achieve this i thought i'd touch on a few of the initiatives we're, we're doing at eoc to sort of achieve this specialist generalist role at least in in a portion of the building um, so we invest a lot in training and staff development um, and we think hard about holistic design. Um, the image here is a diagrammatic output of our EOC training facade training scheme, um, which looks to build our engineers base knowledge in a lot of areas and get a good holistic um, knowledge up before allowing um, individual special specialisms to be exclusively um, pursued. Um, so through training sessions and assessments we on each of these you know myriad of subcategories um we're able to target training needs and understand the strengths and weaknesses of people and this allows us to build project teams that are appropriate to the scope it allows us to complement the you know the people with the right support and the right the right reviews um and to achieve this diversity of knowledge and skills we also have a fantastic and diverse group of engineers which we've, which we've cherry picked from all over the world um, all from different educational backgrounds and all from different projects experience. So we've got a lot of um, graduates who come from European architectural engineering or building engineering degrees, 
And it, these degrees give a great primer into holistic building design, and it's something that we lack in the UK. There, there are a few out there, but a lot of um, a lot of the, the way the UK education system set up is does does produce graduates with blinkers. Um, and aside from these holistically educated engineers um, and the former structural engineers I, I spoke about before, we, we have building physicists, we have ex contractors, we have material specialists. Um, architects, we have technicians, and we even have an aeronautical engineer, all, all of whom are supplementing their previous knowledge and experience to to become specialist journalists in our own little realm of the facade. Um, and they're able to speak the language of other consultants, which which is we think is just fundamentally a valuable thing to be able to do. Um, and finally, to sort of improve our knowledge sharing outside of our own team and outside of our own immediate sphere of influence, we're, we've recently developed an offshore own internet to better in, increase our knowledge sharing across our offices and across our teams in London. Um, and this is further complemented by research and development we're doing with other consultants, with universities, with institutions and, and organisations um, all over the world. So um, we'd like to think this approach adds value um, and, and we'd love to basically see this principle that we're trying to initiate in, in EOC for facades um, taken and applied across whole buildings through this specialist generous technical lead. Um, and um, this person needs to understand and advise and uh, and needs a fundamental reasoning of, of what each of the specialists are doing. So this, like I said earlier, this, this clearly needs institutional and educational support um, from, from those um, uh, sectors and uh, and we would need to upskill. And we're not saying by any means that we're, we're there. Um, and we need to upskill current engineers to fill this role and we'd need future degrees to be put in place to, to start producing the graduates that have the sort of the, the, the skill set that would be required. Um, so for this more generalist role to become established, we'd also need to understand the value it would bring um, and to, to quantify this and justify the, the, the associated costs essentially that, that would come with it and, and um, persuade clients that this is something that is, is valuable to them, which of course we feel it would be because it, it would give such key strategic advantage at the early stages of a project to have that engineering input. So that, that was a brief history of our, our crazy team structures in, in the current industry, um, a brief definition of what I think the problem is and a concept for at least a potential solution. Um, and, and as engineers, we're resisting and attempting to reverse this irony that engineering is becoming more and more commoditized while, while technical performance is increasingly driving and shaping our building design. Um, so, you know, this proposal essentially would put an engineer further, you know, nearer the front seat of design teams, along with the de design and the commercial and the construction players. Um, and yeah, we, th we think that person could be a structural engineer, could be a facade engineer, it could be a new engineer, but it'd be very interesting to hear people's thoughts on this. Thank you. Um, I think now um, there's time for some questions. Um, people have been kind of typing away all over the place, which is great. Um, if you've got any questions, then send them in now into that little chat box. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll hand you over to uh, who's going to start answering the questions. Yeah, I kind of want to read, the, read them myself before reading them out. But um, I'll just go, I'll just read. Um, it's an interesting idea that you have an engineering manager that Move. It's an interesting idea that you have an engineering manager that effectively coordinates the roles and scopes of the engineering team. Who do you envision is responsible for employing this service and similarly how does it ensure the lines of reliability are clear and that there is some, someone that could be considered to be leading the engineering discipline to a particular approach? So um, I sort of touched on this in terms of that problem and responsibility. Clearly we haven't thought this through to a degree where we're, we're saying this is the answer but, but, but in theory having that hierarchical approach and having a uh, appointment and sub consultancy arrangement would would make the lines of uh, you know would make the lines much much clearer um you know if you if you were like it to the sort of main contractor um trade contractor roles where we where the main contractor points their trade contractors um compared to what you know we essentially do a construction management equivalent on design at the moment which which is messy um so who it is, we sp I spoke about, it, it, we're not sure yet, um, but it could be somebody who would need to upskill and, and be educated to, to do that. Um, but but they could take liability, I think they could take liability for um, for their sub-consultants and, and just address the technical portion of a building um, in a very clear way, 
such that a client would maybe only have to actually appoint four parties rather than or four potentially more but you know four key parties i don't know if that um answers the question um another one here um is it realistic to ask one individual person to fulfill this role or does it need to be a team effort um uh, i guess by the by person you mean uh party and by team effort you mean yeah, i'm not sure i understand but i but i think clearly it's going to be the model we have at EOC is that we we have the, this broad generalist approach but we do have pockets of specialism so certainly it would need to be a broader team working as as the generalist um you know multi-headed generalist but i think you know for, for clarity it would want to it would want to vessel through one or two or three people and there are advanced, there you know there are examples of that you know M &E, the M&E world is has sort of been doing this we've got um you know the, you, you often see one M&E engineer turn up to a meeting and they may be a mechanical but they'll talk to the electrical engineer and that's what SIPSI did back in the 70s was try and consolidate a lot of people into one sort of vessel um so you know that, that kind of works and that's sort of what we do on facades we 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 consolidate, we consolidate a lot of specialist information and we, we digest it and we, we turn that into a design and, and communicate those things in a, in a clearer way. So I think, yeah, a team, but ideally funneled through one. Um, there was a lot of questions. <laughs> uh, does this role devalue the architect? So I want to make it clear that no, it, it does, certainly does not devalue the architect. And I don't want any architects to take offense or think they're trying to tread on their shoes. Um, um, it clearly, I, I've sort of outlined it as I think I think it's more of an educational problem. I think it's more of a, it, 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 you know, our industry has been reactive up until now, uh, and I think we're at the point now where it's just unrealistic to expect an architect to just deal with all of that. And I think they probably do need help, um, and I think they probably do need um, technical help, um, which in, currently comes in the form of lots of bolt-on specialists. Um, and I think that could just be much simply uh much more simply consolidated and coordinated so no it shouldn't um given that creating a specialist generalist figure would require a major shift in how building design is undertaken what small manageable steps do you believe would be needed to achieve this or perhaps more briefly what should the next step be um well i think we need to talk about it um this is the first time i've spoken about this as you can probably tell from my um rambles um we, we, we're, it's something we're talking about internally and it's the first time we've sort of um, presented it so I think getting together with industry you know inv invested industry partners and, and other consultants and architects and project managers would be the first step to do and just just talk and, and do a SWOT analysis of this proposal and work out what it might actually look like once everybody's fed in um, I think a workshop is, is the way forward um, the next one is you talked earlier about the introduction of health in the design of buildings do you believe the recent pandemic will result in increased awareness of health in the design building? Um, I think it would make us reevaluate our working from home situation, certainly, the design of our own buildings. Um, I don't know if it will influence commercial or retail buildings. Um, I think certainly we'll have, we'll need, we'll need more in place for the next time this does happen, but um, I can't think well, I haven't thought about how it might actually influence our building design. Um, I'm going to file that under not so relevant to uh, to the topic. <laughs> um, I've got lost here. Um, how would you propose to upskill current engineers to fill a specialist generous role? Um, so ideally we'd get help from the education sector. Um, like I said, there, there are a few UK degrees that, that kind of do look at building design a bit more holistically than others. The, the Europeans do it very well. So I think you know, looking at education and, and having generalist input to architecture degrees and to engineering degrees in the UK would certainly be a good start to, to address the graduate end. And in terms of the, the current stock of engineers, I think that's that's just a case of investment in case of the, the curious people going and doing extra degrees, going and learning uh, and, and continuing to learn. Um, I think that's at the moment the only vessel we have for it without formal um, formal courses and, and so on. Um, 
If architects, who are typically viewed only as a designer, took greater interest in the technical language and the means and methods of building, couldn't they become a specialist journalist? Wouldn't the architect better integrate the design concept and goals, the reality of construction, the knowledge of the project costs, and the reality of construction with, with better communication? So I think, I think what we're saying is that fundamentally the architects would still be the one to integrate all these things into the design. It, it's just a case that we have such a lot of noise at the moment and so much time spent trying to sift through that noise that it's very difficult for the architect to understand what the pertinent points are and why why they're there um, and what we're suggesting is that uh you know the engine not taking over as the designer he's just he's a he's a filter he's a he's somebody who's going to sit there distill and, and explain in an architectural language that, that they can understand without all of the maths and whatever that the architect has already been trained in why why things need to be the way they are um and to to be able to to, to toss up and, and balance the, the technical um parameters in and try and optimize those which is something the architect will struggle to do because they they haven't they don't know necessarily the, the fund of physics they don't know a lot of the, the background to, to many of the specialisms um so yeah the architect would still be the one integrating the, the principles into the design they just they they just helped essentially I would think that those with an environmental science background would make perfect specialist generals, given the essential focus we need to have on designing buildings and operating our buildings more responsibly in the future. A new role for someone who hasn't been central to our process to date. Uh, absolutely. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, you know, part of why we're thinking about this is is the push for sustainability and, and holism. Um, you know, we, as much as we respect sustainability consultants, it's it's difficult to to see the. the that central role of sustainability consultant it really needs to be addressed on all fronts and i think because it is such a technical problem it's you know it's energy um uh, i think yeah i think certainly somebody with a strong background in environmental science should should be leading that um and you know arguably facade engineers have that to a degree um you know we're looking at building physics we're doing sensitivity testing of, of building concepts um so you know that's kind of part of my argument to suggest that we're, we're kind of doing something like that already and maybe it's it's not a huge huge leap to suggest that we, we keep going um uh fascinating presentation to you thank you well, thank you um which of the current models for management of large-scale construction projects um would you consider to be the least worst could you could one of these structures evolve towards your idea rather than starting from scratch um hmm. it, it's it's difficult um one of the slides i showed earlier it, it had it had the sort of reverse stages and the fact that the cdp package sits in stage four and it still baffles me how the tender dates move back and forth from stage three to stage four and, and so on without that cdp package and that input um moving out of reverse stage four um uh, or even after that. Um, so I think the current models uh, are a little bit broken. I think, you know, I, uh, this idea of hierarchical appointments and and a, a golden thread, if you like, of of liability up the train, chain, rather than, like I said, the construction management approach of just a client appointing a whole load of people um, without and, and you know and trying to trying to employ a DR you know design responsibility matrix or something to 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 filter down that liability, I don't think is is ideal. Um, so uh, I don't know which current model is the least worst, but um, no, I'd have to think about that one. Um, is there a need to limit the specialist generalists to only cover a specific school? Why not have the specialist generalists who can span multiples with design skills, engineering skill, um, and construction? Um, well, that's that is harking right back to the master builder, and I think it, there's just too much to do. There, there's too many parameters for for one person to take on. Um, you'd be at university and you'd be studying for your entire life, and you, your brain isn't that big, as far as as far as I can tell. Um, so I think we need. We need people with, from different schools of thought. We need that to create diversity. Otherwise, you know, we need we need to be able to challenge one another on that in that process. Um, you know, we we stare at all the, the old cathedrals and castles and stuff, but they you know they weren't built efficiently. They weren't costed. They they took years, centuries to build. Um, 
and you know they <laughs> their health and safety and in any of this it's um in, in modern construction we need as many we need as many players as we can get to to get that diversity of opinion but we need to consolidate it um i think i'm getting there now um where would you place profiles who are educated both as architect and engineer so yeah i hats off to those people um and you know the architecture engineering degree that i spoke about um and then the guys that go through that i th i think is the right way forward i i did the same i did a i did a civil engineering degree and then did a, an environmental um architecture um, um diploma and I, I i just think it adds so much insight to to what you're doing and to be able to talk that language and, and understand the principle of why things are happening the way they are so i i would place them high on the list of people who could who could fulfill and i i, I can do nothing but um respect people who are trying to add value and trying to, to spread their, their knowledge so they can contribute um, how is the specialist journalist you describe different from the architect if their fees and contract is set up to be similar to the person and character you describe so the architect is is a, a generalist they you know, self-proclaimed generalist because they have to be that is that's entirely their role um what i think the specialist generalist is a little confusing but we're specifically talking about technical matters we're talking about matters that require you probably to come out of school with a, with a physics degree probably to have gone through an engineering and have some sort of engineering chartership to to ground you in in you know in limit state design and to, in, in physics and actual hard numbers um which are fundamentally the things that make the building stand up at the end of the day um so I'd, I'd love it to be the architect but i don't think and it'd be very interesting to hear from the architects i just don't think it's something that they could take on um with that confidence to be able to appoint all the engineers under their own remit and take that liability um but i'd be happy happily proved wrong um how did bim affect the way the work is developed in your area office in south america it's been introduced to some projects but we are not quite far yet Understanding the UK projects are already designed and constructed under the scheme. Um, yeah, um, BIM's going from stride to stride. Um, our structures team, in particular, use it an, an awful amount to, to coordinate and 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 make uh, work streams efficient. Um, it's it's a fantastic tool. In, in facades, we, we we're certainly using it. We're using it um, uh, to to use for three D modelling. We're using it for um, scheduling and so on but we're not we're not trying to draw in Revit for example we're not trying to take a profile and, and roll that out in in, in BIM because I think that's beyond the point of it um but it's, it's coming a long way in the UK it's a bit of a wider wider question so I'm going to move on because I don't, don't think it's necessary that um relay this topic um as future engineers and architects choose their university course what courses do should they be picking to get the point you're describing traditional degrees in the UK have the content currently to generate professionals that can move into this role. So there are some out there, you know. I I ended up having to take two degrees to, to, to sort of try and cover the bases I wanted. Um, you know, you know, places like Bath that that require the graduates or require the, the undergrads to go through a bit of architecture school and a bit of engineering and you know and the dual sort of approach I think are, are fantastic. Um, and I'm, I'm by no means saying the other the degrees are, 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 are no good they're, they're all totally um uh, they're great but i think it's it's that cp um it's the ipd cpd postgraduate learning that one needs to continue and, and to keep sponging in information as um as they as they develop um but you know as i as i picked on earlier europe europe do a really good job and, and places like delft and and uh, polytechnic de milano and, and other big schools like that have produced um you know a, a teaching very holistically and teaching about building physics about structures about um uh, architecture and then trying to wrap in a, a bit of everything which which makes it difficult to specialize immediately but i think um, i think those bases are covered already and i think we need to step back um, um i wanted to know if a generalist knowledge with a specialization is more valuable than just being a specialist uh, Depends what you describe as valuable um, and what you're trying to get. You know, arguably, the arguably the, the most efficient way.
way to make fees would be to sit as a specialist, really hone your, your service, automate it and, and pump out pump out what you do. Um, and that's certainly, you know, the, the division of labor model and, and the, you know, the free market competitive way things are going. But that is what I was talking about in terms of commoditization. Um, you know, the, the bottom line stuff, I'm, you know, I, in terms of value, I'm, I'm thinking value to the client and value to the project, which in which case, absolutely, the generalist knowledge with some specialization is, is always going to be more valuable because you can contextualize what you're doing. Um, uh, how would you envision this engineering generalist? A, gaining the required generalist skills, and B, proving their generalist skills. Yeah, good point. Um, you, said, you said earlier that education would be a big, be a, have a big role. Um, clearly, somebody needs to invest in this. Um, we're trying to invest in it in EOC, but not on a whole building scale. Um, uh, so, it needs training, and you know, we could we could look at um, secondment sort of models and send people to different, you know, create relationships with many engineers, with acousticians, with, with other specialists, and, and and dot people around for, for for a few years before settling down into into the role. And actually get um, hands experience in in all the different in all the different roles could be one model. Um, uh, in terms of proving it, I think I think the architects would probably be the you know you need to build some buildings, but I think the architects would probably be the judge of that because they're the ones who are fundamentally going to be taking the advice and taking the distilled um, uh, the distilled information from from these this role. So the, I think there would be a good litmus test to this. Um, what is the difference between your proposal and your engineering company proposal? Um, so I've, I've never worked for a multi-disc, unless you can call it a multi-disc with two disciplines, um, or three, maybe. Um, uh, so my, you know, my understanding is the multi-disc is, is very attractive to clients. You know, they can offer turn, you know, turnkey in terms of contracts and appointments, but I've often, I've often seen that. You know, departments within those uh, aren't operating that differently to to ourselves collaborating with a, with a, a separate M&E engineer. The fact they're in the same building doesn't always necessarily mean that they're they are coordinating and they are doing any more than we would necessarily be doing as a as a as a specialist company. Um, so it differs dramatically in that um, although the lines of responsibility might be clearer on, on the multi disc um, it, it's that coordination, it's that it's the actual design process of feeding everything through one person or one party, um, rather than you know thirty five people turning up to meetings. Um, it, it's the ability to have those those very rewarding high level conversations, which are informed. Which at, at the moment we have thirty rewarding but long and, and tedious conversations to, to achieve the same aim. Um, how do you make the client aware of the importance of this generous for low budget projects as well? Um, so, I, you know, I was thinking about this and, and to some degree, um, you know, arguably it should pay for itself, if, but but I, I agree it's going to be difficult. I, I touched on that to say that we do need to work out the value of this. We do need to to, to quantify it, to, to sort of sell this principle. Um, you know, arguably, depending on depending on the level of level of um, expertise that the specialist generalist might have, for very small projects, it might be that they can cover en enough of the bases that you don't necessarily need the whole spread of specialists in order to get the benefit of the experience. Um, you know, where, where on a job that you wouldn't empl employ an acoustician, if you employ the specialist generalist role, um, you may get away without employing a specific acoustician if it's not a huge driver for the project and, and some rules of thumb can be applied. Um, arguably what the architect already does on those small jobs but um, potentially with a little bit more um, a little bit more reform potentially. Um, but yeah something I need to think about. Um, would, would this kind of profile as in several educations and several um, you know, design languages help in making the process more efficient. Um, yeah, I think that's what I'm arguing. Uh, I think that it's it, it's the fact that the you know the sub sub specialist doesn't need to talk to the sub sub specialist in in the commercial team because maybe they don't already, but but because it's been filtered and and 
you know the small decisions have been made uh, to the point where you know when you're sitting actually making the key design decisions there it's a much more productive um, conversation and, and you know arguably the things that we, we don't talk enough about will, there'll be more time there'll be more um, onus on talking about things like sustainability um, in my country we call such specialist project coordinator and we coordinate with all consultants the construction PMC um, all contractors and materials suppliers the role is taken up by an architect with a small team under the person <coughs> um, so I think you know what I didn't really address and I, I said at the beginning I wasn't going to touch on construction but you know going back to this renaissance divide of design and construction what I've very much been talking about here is the is the front end designing of the buildings you know we're seeing more and more long engagements with, with contractors which arguably um, which is arguably the right way forward um, in, in, in the sense that we're going to get we're going to get a more buildable building um, and you're going to get earlier market input so you know not, not not uncommon to see sort of stage two PCSAs happening at the moment um, but I think the, the, the construct the, the coordinator the project coordinator you're talking about is potentially more like a construction manager or the architect at, at the back end of the job where we're actually building with contractors and materials suppliers. we're talking about actually fundamentally shaping the building and coming up with the design concept and you know the point I made at the end is that we just feel that that potentially in the engineering aspect given the technical parameter you know technical performance requirements are such a key driver of, of building designs now uh, there, there just isn't enough of an engineering input i don't think at that very early stage so you said a lot of a lot of a lot of services you see in the industry are, are, are retrofit bolt-on um services which which is sort of trying to trying to retro retro justify a, a potential board concept because it since you shouldn't have been that way if an engineer was involved at the beginning um, uh, and finally, how would a fee structure for a specialist journalist look like? Oh, that's well beyond what I've thought about today. Um, but but it would need to be very considered. It would need to think hard about, you know, not annoying the architects and taking their portion. Um, and, and, and just, I think it, it's not going to come from anybody else's pot. Um, it would need to be justified as a, as a valuable thing to do and, and an added value service that could that could um, generate enough value to pay for itself. Um, so I don't know what that fee structure is. We need to think about it and we need to, um, yeah, go from there. I think that's the end of the questions. So thank you for all those. Super. Yeah. Thanks very much, guys. That's brilliant. Well done, Hugh, for getting through all of the all of the questions. It was an absolute barrage of them. So it, it kind of shows what, yeah. um, what, what level of interest there is for this kind of thing out there. So. Um, I think you're kind of hitting on, you're, you're onto something there, Hugh. Um, Liz asked a question, um, can I, um, uh, where, where is all your stuff published? So I'd just like to say that um, it is published and it's in the iStruck D magazine. Uh, which issue, Hugh, was it? Can you remember? Um, uh, it's the special future trend issue, so it would have been a couple of months ago now, I think. Yeah, I think May, it was in December. Yeah, I think it was in December issue. Absolutely. Well, um, Go and go and read that. I'm sure you can find it online, uh, but it's got much more information and more detailed stuff in there. So, um, and if you want to get in touch with us for anything else, then feel free. Um, you've got Hugh's email address down there, and my email address is Catherine at eocengineers.com. So, um, yeah, get in touch. And huge thanks for joining us. This will be up on the website um, tomorrow to watch again um, and spread the word. Have a look at uh, our other program um, of events going on. Uh, later on and uh, we hope to see you soon brilliant thanks very much indeed guys hope to see you soon have a lovely evening take care Thanks. bye, bye.